Y'all yeah, can talk about all these viruses, and that's good, but you can't forget the main one. It's plaguing us, bro. It's time now for the People's War Radio Show, where we do talk about the main virus. And that is colonialism. People's War Radio Show, we talk with healthcare workers, activists, revolutionaries, authors, teachers, and regular people from the African community. We aim to bring you an African internationalist analysis on all things important to winning our freedom from colonialism. The root of all our problems. Why I'm poor. The colonial virus keeps me at war. The colonial virus. Yo, that thing Colonial virus. Down the colonial virus. Down with the Welcome to the People's War Radio Show. I'm Dr. Matsumela Odom. And I'm Dexter Mlamwingu. Uhuru means freedom in Swahili, and freedom is on our minds 24 7. On November 6th and 7th, the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations held its 13th annual. Black People's March on the White House, followed by its annual conference in Washington, D.C. Africans, other colonized people, and white people in solidarity gathered at Malcolm X Park and marched to Lafayette Park, where they held a rally to mobilize for justice and self-determination for black people. The next day, local and remote representatives of the various organizations that make up the Black is Back Coalition came together, some in person, and some virtual, and held their annual conference, broadcast online for the safety of the audience during the current pandemic. Dexter and I had the privilege of attending the march and the conference this year. The Black is Back Coalition is a coalition of 18 different Black organizations united around anti-imperialist principles of self-determination. Governed by the idea of unity and struggle, the Black is Back Coalition was formed on September 12, 2009, during a meeting of more than a dozen activists and organizations in Washington, D.C. It was in November 2009 that the Black is Back Coalition held the first national Black demonstration against the Obama White House at a time when African people were being told to be patient, give Obama time, and keep praying that he would make positive changes for the Black community. The Black is Back Coalition's inaugural action put forward their position stating the following. Many well-meaning people in this country and around the world are afraid to take more progressive political positions for fear of being seen as anti-Black. We need to remind people of the absolute lack of progress since new faces assume leadership of this nation. Many of the leading concerns of Black people, Latinos, and working class people in this country remain insufficiently addressed. Black and brown people continue to suffer the brunt of un- and underemployment and predatory loan scandal crises. The statement continued, military spending under Obama has increased, as has the warfare this nation continues to export to Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Venezuela, and Colombia. Mass incarceration, police brutality, and political imprisonment remain rampant, and the most negatively impacted by the levee breach in post-Katrina New Orleans continue to be without homes, jobs, or health care assistance. And to that point, these are precisely the communities who nationally will be the most negatively affected by yet another myth of health care reform, quote-unquote. This year's march was titled Deepening the Resistance to Police Terror, Honoring Our Political Prisoners and Prisoners of War. Black community control of the police. Understanding colonialism as the primary mode of capitalist production 
In their 2021 call to action, the coalition recognized the importance of the hastening crisis of imperialism. Especially in the wake of the January 6th near coup, the U.S. defeat in Afghanistan, and the global uprising of African and colonized people. Their 2021 call to action states The Black is Back Coalition has boldly taken up the mantle to advance the struggle to end the relentless police murders of our people and to liberate our freedom fighters from the U.S. prison death camps. In this episode, We'll present some excerpts from the rallies, the march, and the conference. Full coverage of the conference can be found at the Black is Back Coalition's Facebook page. Welcome to the stage, Chairman Omali Yeshatella. And what rescued Europe was the black attack on Africa, Portugal first, uh, with this assault on Africa 600 years ago. This is what began to change the world. This is the origin of the political economy that we experience today. 600 years ago, we've been fighting for 600 years as black people. But some of us are confused. Because with the advent of this colonial white power, they had the power to rebrand us too. That's why some of you are named Jones and Thomas. Uh, You don't find that name uh, in Africa. That's a name that was imposed on us, right? That's why you have a place that's called Nigeria. Is the real that this was something that was named by a white woman uh, who was with the white man named Frederick Lugar. In 1915, Nigeria didn't exist until 1915. I hear a lot of people talk about they went and saw their ancestry and where our family comes from, Nigeria couldn't have come from Nigeria. (laughs) Was no such thing as Nigeria until 1915. And the way it came to be Nigeria is because England sent this man Lugar, who was a uh, so-called entrepreneur, uh, to uh, this territory and he was to unite the territories under one administration. And he was faced with the question of what to call it. And his mistress, who was to become his wife, named Flora Shaw, she said, let's call it nigger area. That's how you got Nigeria. And people are running around willing to die for, for nigger area. Uh, the fact is, we were never nigger areas. And then you have places like West Africa. You've heard me mention this before, like West Africa. You have a situation of Portuguese go there and then they find on the shore a uh, shrimp. And so they named the place after the word for shrimp, which is Cameroon. So you got black people running around calling themselves Cameroonians, but they are not shrimp any more than you are black American or Negro American. The fact is they named us, they took our resources, they took the power over our lives. They defined themselves through that process and then they defined us. We said, hell with that. Black is back, black is back. This is what we are saying. And colonialism is on the run everywhere. Look at what the US has been trying to do in Venezuela. The people of Venezuela have been able to take a stand and despite everything they've done, they've sabotaged, they've tried to starve the people. They forced, trying to force the people to overthrow their own government. It hasn't worked up to now. Look at where the China, China Cuba, tiny Cuba standing by itself, yes. fighting against this power. Yes. Look at what's happening all around the world. We see yes. people are fighting back and winning their freedom. Look at what just happened uh, just the other day. Uh, in the Middle East, where uh, they had uh, control of uh, this territory for such a long time. What am I talking about? Say it. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. They say they in Afghanistan fighting against terrorism. They went to the country, they stole the people's country, the resources. They attacked the people and they held the people for 20 years. They had military forces spending more than a trillion dollars there, creating an army of more than 300,000 people. This was colonialism. Colonialism is simply 
the foreign and alien domination of a people. How in the hell can you not know that black people here live under foreign and alien domination, but they trick you? So you can't recognize that it's foreigners and aliens that control you. They make you, they give you a hyphen. After 400 years in this country, they gave you a hyphen. And that hyphen is now you become an African American. That's all you got out of it. An African American which tricks you and thinks, makes you think that you're part of the same system you're supposed to be fighting against. Yeah. And so I just wanted to say that we live in a land right now uh, that has come into existence as a consequence of an attack on indigenous people. Nobody even mentions them if they're not in the room. Right. I'm talking about the so-called Indians. I'm talking about the people that use this euphemism uh, to speak to the fact that there are concentration camps in this country that they call Indian reservations, right? In fact, they are stuffed in these situations where they're dying lifespans in the 30s and 40s. This is their territory, their land. And then they take us from our land and bring us here. And the ones who did it make themselves legal and then they make us illegal. So the so-called Mexican, they stole Mexico in 1948, uh, put an illegitimate border there, and then said that if the Mexican people come across this border, that they created their illegal aliens. So here you have a situation where aliens come to a territory, steal the territory, set up a government of their own, and then define themselves as the good guys, and then define the people from whom they stole the land as the bad guys. That's what we never with. Black is back. Black is back. So what some of us are involved in, we have this route, but we recognize that African and African people have to be free. Every square inch of Africa. You can live here in peace if you know the whole continent of Africa is oppressed. African nation has been forcibly dispersed. We are one Africa and one nation. That's what you're looking at when you say what they call Haiti. That's what you're looking at when you look at Jamaica and Trinidad and all over the Caribbean and Bermuda. Uh, you're looking at one Africa. That's what you're looking at when you see Ghana and Somalia and Nigeria and all these other places, one Africa. And we are everywhere we are Africa is. Africa is everywhere we are. And so we are engaged in a struggle. This is a part of it. And I just wanted to say, the, 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 the theme, again, is resisting, deepening the resistance to police terror. Uh, and we should come to understand that uh, we are going to have to use every means we can. We don't, we don't have a right to voluntarily die, to let somebody kill us with impunity just because they got a uniform on. Yeah. That, that's insane. We, we would have be something wrong with us. Yeah. They got a uniform on, therefore they can kill us. Right? And do horrible things to us. So deepening the resistance to police terror. And that's what it is, terror that we live on a regular basis. Honoring our political prisoners and prisoners of war. You see people who having these posters up. These courageous African men and women, women who stood up for black people, black power at a time uh, 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 when revolution was the main trend in the entire world. They represented part of the military defeat against our movement. They ought to be free. They should be honored. They should be given rewards for fighting against the system that some people like to pretend they recognize was wrong. They like to say, well, the police are bad. Well, if the police are bad, what they're doing, killing our people in our community, what was wrong with shooting? You can't have it both ways. If the police were bad for murdering black people, if you can conclude in 2020 and 2021, that the police were unjustly killing black people as they do and, uh, frequently now, especially after George Floyd. If the police were doing all these things and bad and killing us, then what was wrong with killing the police? If the police were killing us like this, the police function and exist as a colonial military, domestic military force in our community. And they got to go. There, there is no reform in that. They got to go. They got to go. That was Chairman Amali Chitella, leader of the Black is Back Coalition and Chairman of the African People's Socialist Party. 
Performing at the rally was Lucy Murphy in the Black Workers' Congress Choir. We who believe in justice can arrest and kill it all. I can't hear you. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it Let's comes. see if they got it. We who believe in justice cannot rest, cannot rest. We who believe in justice cannot rest until it won. Until the killing of black boys, black mothers' sons is as important as the killing of white boys, white mothers' sons. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it comes. And that which touches me most is that I had a chance to work with people, passing on to others that which was passed on to me. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it comes. The older I get, the better I know that the secret of my going on is when the reins are in the hands of the young who dare. To run against the soul. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it comes. To me, young people come first. They, come first. they have the courage where we fail. Yes. And if I can shed some light. As they carry us through the gale, we who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it comes. Struggling myself don't mean a whole lot. I've come to realize that teaching others to stand and fight. Is the only way our struggle survives. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it comes. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest. Until it comes. I'm a woman who speaks in a voice, and I must be heard. Sometimes I can be quite difficult. I'll bow to no man's word. We who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest. Until it comes, we who believe in justice can arrest, can arrest. We who believe in justice can arrest until it comes. You are listening to the People's War Radio Show, produced by WBPU Black Power ninety six point three FM in Saint Petersburg, Florida. Today we are recapping the 13th annual Black is Back Coalition Black People's March on the White House, held from November 6th to November 7th, 2021 in Washington, D.C. The conference held on day two was broadcast online, but also attended in person by leaders of the coalition and members of the African community. The conference opened in memoriam of founding coalition member, the late Glenn Ford, presented by Lisa Davis, vice chair of the Black is Back Coalition. Black is Back Coalition Chairman Omalia Shatella delivered a political overview. The conference consisted of three panel discussions, deepening the resistance to police terror, honoring our political prisoners and prisoners of war, Black community control of police, Black community control of electoral politics, 
in a concluding discussion of key points of the Black is Back Coalition's platform, National Black Political Agenda for Self-Determination. Let's hear some of the excerpts from the first panel, Deepening Resistance to Police Terror, Honoring Our Political Prisoners and Prisoners of War, Black Community Control of the Police. First, we'll hear from John Lamont. John Lamont is a member of the Ohio 7, who was convicted of quote-unquote seditious conspiracy, along with other members of the United Freedom Front. He was released from McCreary Federal Prison on May 15, 2021, after 37 years in captivity. As we struggle and fight to uh, get political prisoners released, uh, to get people to even just out of segregation units while they're still in prison and so forth, because political prisoners, the activist revolutionary prisoners, uh, always are put in the worst and most horrendous kind of physical condition. Um, you know, so as we to, to to get people out and to get them, you know, so they're not murdered, uh, we have to keep in mind that law and legality is not is a tool that we have to use and we should use. And we've seen it just successfully used um, with the release just last week of Maroon. Uh, of course, he's very ill, and uh, but he's at home with his family. We also saw it with the parole just a day later of David Gilbert, uh, spent more than 41 years in prison um, for revolutionary uh, activities. So um, these were utilizing legal measures and legal skills like law students and lawyers. Those are very necessary things. But we all we definitely need to keep in mind, just as the chairman pointed out, that the legality of the of the of the colonial imperialist so-called state of the United States of America has that's not the 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 rules and laws that really guide us. But we have to sometimes use those laws to try to affect necessary small changes. One thing I would also like to say, especially with uh, the um, International Tribunal that ended about two weeks ago, and then with the release of a couple of political prisoners, is one thing we need to keep in mind as we struggle day in and day out in our, in our towns and neighborhoods and wherever it is that we're on the ground at. And oftentimes, you know, the same struggle needs to go on for years and even decades um, without like seeing any kind of like real dramatic results. But then again, we have to understand that struggle does bring results. And we just recently saw, well, even with yesterday's demonstration with the tribunal a few weeks ago, with the release of Maroon, with the release of David, that we need, just need to keep pushing. We need to find more and uh, stronger avenues to, to, you know, enhance the struggle. But as long as we keep struggling, as long as we keep fighting, as long as we keep organizing, resisting, struggle will bring results. And that was John Lamont. Next up, we have Sister Betty Davis of New York City. Sister Betty is the chair of the Black Community Control of Education Working Group. A review of data from six large police departments around the country reveals that nearly 4,000 young people ages 17 and under experienced police violence through 2015, 2015 through 2020. Almost 800 of the children and teens, roughly a fifth of the total, were Black girls. White girls were involved in only about 150. 20 cases representing only 3% of the use of force incidents involving minors. The investigation looked at racial disparities in use of force cases in Chicago, sound familiar? Minneapolis, sound familiar? Columbus, Ohio, and Portland, Oregon. So with that statistic, I am amazed that there are people who are talking about the black on black crime of the youth in our so-called inner cities. Every person who studies psychology or sociology understands that if you cannot fight your oppressor, you will internalize their hatred. 
So the work of slavery is not done until it becomes self-perpetuating. If we do not teach our children, our young, that they have the right to self-defense and self-determination, they will turn that anger in on themselves and us. It's a no-brainer. You should not be taking the guns from the youth. You should be teaching them who to aim at. That's the issue. Now, when you talk about critical race theory in the school, I'll never forget the day we took our entire school to see a play. This is an elementary school, first grade through sixth grade, about Frederick Douglass and his struggle for freedom. They all rose up when Frederick Douglass was fighting back and said, kill him, kill him, kill him. You don't have to teach them how to fight. You have to teach them who to fight. And this is what community control of education does. That was Sister Betty Davis, chair of the Black is Back Coalition, Black Community Control of Education Working Group. Next, we'll hear from Belinda Parker Brown of Slidell, Louisiana. Comrade Belinda is the CEO of Louisiana United International, a leading anti-prison organization. Let's take a listen. You know, recently, um, um, several years, 2019, we got a victory here where we changed the Constitution, the Jim Crow laws here in Louisiana that stated that you can become a prisoner and um, with a non-unanimous jury verdict. Um, they, um, you know, we, we were able to rally and get that changed here. Uh, But more so than that, we went all the way up to the highest court in the land and they had to rule that what Louisiana did here for 120 years was unconstitutional. And thousands of people that had been put in prison wrongfully uh, would be uh, determined that, you know, it was illegal what they did. And um, since that have taken place, we still have not got freedom for these people. They are still being held hostage, kidnapped inside of these godforsaken hellhole prisons and jails across the state. I mean, to the tune of thousands, it could be, I know for sure we have vetted over 8,000 cases of people that should not be in prison. So what we're saying is that we cannot wait. We cannot wait no longer because like Brother Raph just told us, we know the game. We know that you never intend to do the right thing in the first place. So we didn't figure it out. So we don't have to um, you know, um, run around and chase the rabbit, okay? Um, run around in circles, you know, trying to, you know, um, force you to do this, force you to do that, you know, ask you permission, you know, uh, because you don't intend to do what's right in the first place. And that was Belinda Parker Brown of Louisiana United International. Next up, we'll hear from Zaki Baroudi, President General of the Universal African People's Organization in St. Louis, Missouri. Let's take a listen. Mike Brown, who had his hands up. Don't shoot. And they killed them. Yet yeah, every one of them are walking free, the killers. Let's be clear what we're dealing with. And it's not just those incidents I'm dealing with. Deepening the resistance to police terror. Anything else less than we playing games. And so when we look at responses, hmm. We have to incorporate, every, we got to have in their mind, and I'm not just talking about officers, I'm putting this on me. Because just most recently, I'm so outraged that with Jason Stockley, he asked for what's called a bench trial, mm-hmm. where you had a judge, which was a white judge, mm-hmm. that our progressive St. Louis City prosecuting attorney, and I sat in during the trial, mm-hmm. did a great job, but this one white judge said he was innocent. Mm. Then we just had a recent case where another white officer got his siren on 
I mean, not old, mm -hmm. off. And lights off. Speeding through our community, he had killed a 12-year-old. And he had a bench trial, and a, his judge was a white judge, yeah. and he was found innocent. Yeah. Speak, mm -hmm. speak on it. I don't know where you at, mm -hmm. but I'm sick and tired of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That was Zaki Baruti of the Universal African People's Organization. Now, we'll hear from Khalid Rahim of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where he leads a new African independence party. Let's take a listen. Strategically, one of the things I like to offer is that it is so important for us to connect our political work to the demand for the release of political prisoners. And when I say our political work, I'm talking about those of us who engage in electoral politics. When we campaign, for example, when we're educating people, when we're learning from the people, when we're communicating with the people, we need to all, always include the demand for release of political prisoners as part of our political work. One of the things that I find to be kind of problematic is that over the last few decades, um, many of us actually neglected that type of communication. So we did outreach to international friends and allies. We did outreach to people uh, from different parts of the country, right? But we didn't really focus on our local communities in terms of ed educating the masses of people locally about the political prisons that many of them knew nothing about because the system had made sure that they knew nothing about them. So as we move forward, I think it's so important that we connect our struggles around freedom for political prisoners to our struggles around the everyday material realities that impact the life of Black people. That was Brother Khalid Rahim of the New African Independence Party from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Last but not least, we'll hear from Life Malcolm. Life Malcolm is an attorney and community organizer from Tampa, Florida. In this excerpt, Life speaks of the low-intensity warfare waged against the African community. <laughs> if there's a such thing, as low intensity warfare, mm -hmm. and yeah. it is mm -hmm. low intensity warfare, you know, food deserts. Mm -hmm. No, they don't always come out with guns blazing, right? right. Flashing bang grenades, right. right? Low intensity warfare, helicopters over your head all night long, disturbing your sleep. Yeah. Low intensity warfare, showing you all kinds of images on TV that degrade you and deprecate you and I. Yeah. Low intensity warfare. Yeah. There's low intensity warfare. Right. Must be something like uh low intensity resistance. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Low intensity resistance. We can do that, right? I got some ideas about that. I want to share that with you. The reason why low intensity warfare has to be part of this equation of resistance. And low intensity resistance has to be a part of this equation of resistance. It's because when Malcolm said by any means necessary, he also meant by every means necessary. Yeah. <laughs> Don't just know your rights. I know that's something that we say in BIBC and even in the park, but I'm learning. That's not enough to just know your rights. You also got to know the law. Yes. Because sharing the money will tell you. And these people are tricky. They tell you one thing out of one side of their mouth, out of one side of their mouth, and they tell you something else out of the other side. Yes. For example, they tell you you have the right to remain silent. Same. Uh -huh. Right? Mm -hmm. And you do. But what they don't tell you is you have to say that you are invoking your right to remain silent in order for it to work. So now you have this right to remain silent. <laughs> And you being silent, thinking you exercising your right, but if you don't say, I have the right to remain silent, they take that and use that as evidence of your guilt. Yeah. Are you with me on that? Yes. <laughs> don't just give these people that part. the low intensity <laughs> warfare ammo to shoot you down. There you go. Speak. One thing to know your rights, but know the law. That's one thing. That was Life Malcolm of Tampa, Florida. For the past five years, the Black is Back Coalition has held an annual electoral campaign school. 
This training program is a means by which the coalition brings the struggle for black self-determination into the electoral arena, teaching ordinary African people, workers, activists, women, and youth how to run for office. Next, we'll hear from two leaders in that effort, New York Assemblyman Charles Barron and St. Louis Alderman Jesse Todd. Assemblyman Barron is a former member of the original Black Panther Party who has successfully taken the struggle for black power into the electoral arena, representing the district that includes the black community of Brooklyn. Along with his wife, New York City Councilwoman Inez Barron, Assemblyman Barron is founder of Operation Power. So I just wanted to uh, say to our people that are in the radical revolutionary movement as a tactic, the electoral arena is an awesome area to be in when we win, lose, or draw, because you can have either, either power or influence. And there's a difference between power and influence. When we march and demonstrate or hold seminars and try to hold people and persuade people in power to make decisions in our best interest, that's influence. When you have that seat yourself, that's power when you can actually make the decision. And nobody has absolute power, it's always connected. But in our instance, the power of the city council is that we pass the budget, we pass all of the municipal laws, we also pass whether or not a developer can use city-owned land to develop anything, the city picks the developer, so I can't do that. But whoever they pick, I could reject, modify, or support the project. And once that project is in my local community, the council gives deference to the local community members, so that subcommittee will vote in favor of whatever the council member says. So even if a billionaire like Donald Trump came to my beloved East New York, and said that he wanted to build Trump Towers on city-owned land on Alabama Avenue in my community, he has to see the Black Panther or else it can't get through. No matter how much money he has, he doesn't have the power. He Now he has the money to persuade if he gets to some of those committee members and say, hey, look, I'll give you all a million apiece if you vote against Charles saying no, he could do that, but he does not have the power so when we do our power analysis, which we all should do, whatever we, when we're organizing around issues or organizing for power, we should do a power analysis. So who has the power to make the decision that we want to have happen? That was Assemblyman Barron from Brooklyn, New York. Now we will hear from Jesse Todd. Todd is an alderman of St. Louis's 18th Ward where he has led the fight against ward reduction in defense of the African community of North St. Louis. Let's hear what he has to say. So I want to give credit to Malcolm X, which he said Africans should control the po politics and politicians in his or our own community. The politicians uh, to upgrade it should run on a 19-point program. With that 19-point uh, progr program, uh, we must use it to articulate the 19 point program, every opportunity we get. We must prioritize those, the 19 point program and, uh, and we have to deliver, get the constituents material, materials, quality of life results that were, were articulated and prioritized. Most people can articulate and prioritize, but at the end, what counts is that you can deliver on what you prioritize. So we don't want to articulate and we always must have a long range plan and a short range plan. I have, and you must keep this plan with you because you're going to be challenged because your enemy is going to, our enemy is going to challenge us. I have what's called a Todd plan, which fits into what are all the, the services that are, that the older man or woman can have most influence on. For example, the main point is they, we have, uh, I uh, advocate drug treatment, uh, that's one thing. Vacant houses would be boarded up on all floors. This is simple. Money that has been used in the past to tear down houses would be given to uh, families to fix up houses. Uh, 
grass on lots, alleys, and vacant buildings will be cut and trimmed as needed, and trash will be cleaned up. In our community north of Delmar, the uh, services uh, I have to battle to make them uh, clean off the lots. In fact, uh, the two months when I was Democrat committed man, I had to have a sit in in various offices, including the Parks Department, and we finally got some services. And then two months after I had had won the alderman's position, I had to picket uh, the uh, forestry, which cuts grass, trees, and clean, and supposed to clean up, but they wouldn't do neither right. So I had to have a picket there. The street department wouldn't pass the street, so I had to go pick it down. You are listening to the People's War Radio Show, produced by WBPU, Black Power 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. Today, we are recapping the 13th annual Black is Back Coalition Black People's March on the White House, held from November 6th to November 7th, 2021 in Washington, D.C. The work of the Blacks Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations is guided by a 19-point platform titled The National Black Political Agenda for Self-Determination. Panelists at the conference held on November 7, 2021 discussed some of the key points. Ralph Pointer and Jihad abdul Mamit presented on point number four, a call to free all political prisoners. This point declares that, quote, this includes politicized prisoners who may have originally been in prison for non-political reasons, but whose achieved political consciousness after imprisonment resulted in political acts or statements that are punished by specialized treatment and sometimes additional prison time. The definition of political prisoners is also extended to all those activists and militants who have been detained or arrested during the most recent wave of resistance in places like Ferguson, Missouri, Baltimore, Maryland, and Milwaukee, Wisconsin. We reject the authority of the U.S. state to imprison persons whose imprisonment is rooted in their defense of black people's democratic and self-determination rights. Black people ourselves have the right and responsibility to designate those individuals and categories of prisoners to be immediately released from U.S. confinement and control, end quote. Ralph Pointer is the head of the Black is Back Coalition's working group on political prisoners. He's a longtime organizer for Black Community Control of Education in New York City and leader of the Lynn Stewart Committee. We've been begging the system for years to release our political prisoners because they are guilty of what we all should be guilty of, working for freedom. This is their only crime. Our brothers and sisters who gave up life to defend us. And I say, no politician should be elected in a Black constituency or anywhere where Black people have a deciding vote if they don't support the freedom of our political prisoners. We must support those who raise their fists against injustice. And I will go to our late Lynn Lynn Stewart when she says, no people can claim a movement if they leave their political prisoners behind. That was Ralph Pointer, head of the Black is Back Coalition's Working Group on Political Prisoners. Jihad abdul Mamit is chairperson of the National Jericho Movement, a member organization of the Black is Back Coalition, dedicated since its founding in 1998 to campaigning for the release of freedom fighters, political prisoners, and prisoners of war held by the U.S. government. Jihad is a former political prisoner himself, And since his release, he has dedicated his work to fighting for the release of other African freedom fighters. Sisters and brothers, we had a a pretty phenomenal year with uh, freedom fighters coming home. Uh, This year, Jan Lyman had come home. Um, We had uh, Maroon Schultz recently released on October 25th, albeit uh, justice uh, delayed is justice denied, as we say, after almost 50 years in prison. Um, stage four terminal cancer, it predicted a couple of months to live, and now he's released from prison. So as al Haj Malik al-Shabazz said, you know, you stick a knife in our back and pull it out six inches, that's not progress. And it isn't progress. 
but we accept the victory. We embrace our comrade coming home. Uh, he's in the hospice uh, at his, as, at his um, um, not his sister's house, but at a family member's house. Okay, yes, sister's house, excuse me. And so uh, people are able to see him, I guess, strategically. Uh, so he's not doing that well. But he sends his regards and love to everybody and, and appreciation uh, for their effort to always uplift him. You know, Maroon got his name by by freeing himself out of captivity in numerous times. So um, he is our, our champion. And our prayer to him is that his spirit always will be lifted up for forevermore amongst the psychic and minds of the people and our charge for freedom and self-determination because he surely represented that. We had David Gilbert come home just the other day an anti-imperialist, uh, a freedom fighter. Uh, so we had some victories. So here we are in a condition with our freedom fighters languishing in prison. And we're wondering if people even know who they are. You say, well, why would a person that's 80 some years old, such as uh, Sundi Adekoli, what is the threat that, you know, of letting him back out? So a person that's naive may ask that. Well, we all know that is the mind our powerful revolutionary thinking that's in total lockstep and sync with everything that your chairman said on this platform today, because that's the reason. That's the reason who you would get out and talk to. Who's, who's John talking to right now? Who will Maroon get a chance to talk to in the last days of his life? Who is he going to inspire to influence to make them see the reality, to energize them, to pick up the, the, the torch of freedom? Who are we going to influence? And by golly, you better believe we can influence a lot of people as I'm sitting here right now. So the 23 years in prison I spent, you know, as pittance compared to my comrades that are in jail in prison for 50 years or so, because it's perfectly fine, you know, that white supremacists can bum rush their own capital, you know, five police officers killed, and they can academicize and intellectualize and take them to court. And yes, well, mm -hmm, and all that, but let you talk about genocide and call a spade a spade. Let you just utter it, hope as few you know, to uplift consciousness of more people and freeing the remaining freedom fighters that are in prison right now. That was Jihad Abdul Mamid, chairperson of the National Jericho Movement, speaking at the 2021 conference of the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations. Masamela, you spoke at the conference on point number three, Black Community Control of the Police. Let's hear a little bit of your presentation. You know, I know that in the last year and a half, there's been a lot of, of mobilization uh, uh, behind uh, the death of um, uh, George Floyd. Uh, but it, we need to move you all from mobilization to organization. The only way to do this is with the anti-colonial demand and the um, uh, program of Black Community Control of Police by the uh, Black is Back Coalition. Yesterday, uh, we heard from a sister here locally uh, who's organizing around the police murder of a young brother named uh, DeAndre Johnson here. And she notes that uh, while the exact same neo-colonial mayor of DC will write a uh, uh, Black Lives Matter or something like that uh, on the street uh, leading up to the White House, uh, that that same uh, neo-colonial mayor uh, did not put a single name of any of the people killed by uh, DC Metro PD in those names. They're only people killed outside of this place. And I know many of you all but the same way in which you got neo-colonial leaders, colonial politicians, the liberal left, everyone uh, saying uh, the, the name of George Floyd uh, and not talking about uh, uh, the, the constant terror and assault against your own community that is happening where you are. So the Black Community Control of the Police, this is vital for y'all to get behind. Black Community Control of the Police is an anti-colonial demand. Black Community Control of the Police demands the immediate withdrawal of all domestic military uh, occupation of uh, 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 forces in our communities. The, 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 this democratic demand assumes the ability of Black people to mobilize for our own security and to redefine the role of the police so that it no longer functions as an agency imposed <coughs> on us from the outside. Uh, black community control of police understands that the primary contradiction we face as African people is colonial capitalism. Mm -hmm. The solution uh, uh, to we are struggling towards is power placed into the hands of African people, not kinder, nicer police officers that go and play basketball with people. And then you find out that that same officer who shot a three-pointer shot a black kid 
Right. Right. Um, many people are concerned with anti-racist policing, rooting out the uh, uh, the racist and bigoted cops. Right. We see the 2019 um, uh, Center for Investigative Reporting knowing that there are hundreds of active duty officers that are uh, um, uh, members of, uh, you know, anti-Islam, pro-Confederate, white nationalist hate groups, right? We see the things like the Plain View Project, which found, found that almost 20% of cops, uh, they studied and endorsed violence, racism, and bigotry. You know, all these cops that have been found members of the Klan, we know that, uh, you know, people like William Parker, uh, the police chief actively recruited segregationists uh, uh, from the South and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, we understand this, right? Well, of course, this is the natural side effects of a colonial system that has uh, 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 the white world living at, uh, at the uh, expense of African uh, people. But despite how flagrant uh, all these uh, instances are that we talk about, it's merely a symptom of a larger uh, a problem of colonial capitalism. The colonial system of policing uh, allows for white workers, not just the white ruling class, to exist and thrive at the expense of the African working class. The liberal left likes to draw a distinction between labor unions and police associations. That's what we say. They're not unions, right? No, the police police associations, police unions work exactly the way that white white labor unions have always worked, and the police associations no different than, uh, than, than the way in which uh, uh, these unions and the white working classes have always have functioned on the theft of African labor and resources. The police serve as occupying armies within the, the colonies of African and indigenous communities globally. In the US, the police serve as a white working class association that uh, negotiate power uh, 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 with the white rule cast at the expense. They sit at, at white workers, they're, uh, they're just another form of white workers standing on the pedestal of the African working class. This underscores actually the problems with this idea of defund the police and de-unionization as a solution. The solution is black community control of the police. Since uh, the murder of George Floyd, you know, like I said, police unions have come under attack. Activists have demanded that the funding of the defunding of police departments and the disassociation of the labor movement from police unions. Uh, we see this, we see in a place like Los Angeles where Eric Garcetti was boasted for cutting $150 million uh, uh, out of the police budget. That's only like um, 10 per, less than 10% of the one point eight billion dollar annual budget that they have right and then they divert them to community programs what are these community programs basketball leagues and nonsense like that run exactly by the police by probation officers in which they in which these police come to our community and then force your children to go win trophies for the police department that's just another extension of the colonial capitalist relationship that they have constructed with us this measure was passed, for example, in Seattle, where activists uh, occupied the Capitol Hill section of, uh, of, the, of the city and took over an abandoned police station in Minneapolis, where everyone said they disbanded the police. And in every single instance where they said they were going to disband the police, what happens? They bring in the sheriffs, right? They bring in the sheriffs as if, as if SD or PD makes a difference in the relationship that that these forces have uh, 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 with us, as if Halliburton or USMC makes a difference on what an, uh, uh, a U.S. soldier has on their uniform when they're shooting someone in Afghanistan. It doesn't, right? So, so um, without black community control of police, defunding the police is just another uh, uh, austerity measure placed uh, just to reduce the budgets and actually make. Uh, colonial capitalism and these uh, uh, cities and these cities work better. We saw that we saw that in 2012, where uh, Stockton, California, for example, um, cut a um, uh, 14 million dollars uh, from their police by these same sorts of things. Uh, took a fourth of their uh, of, of their print uh, of, of their department uh, and cut those jobs. But those but none of those resources came to the African African community. 
The conditions of Africans in Stockton haven't changed. Without revolutionary demands to remove all of the police and occupying armies from the African communities, replacing with black community control of police, the defund the move, the fund of police becomes little more than, like I said, just an austerity measure. Right. Uh, Chairman O'Malley uh, in his famous speech uh, notes that the police become necessary in human society only at the juncture in human society where it's a split between those that have and those who ain't got. Defunding the police and police deunionization do not resolve the colonial contradictions that, 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 that produced the police in the first place. Right. The balanced budgets only, only seem to actually preserve the violent occupation of African communities. This is what you actually hear when you see, see, see these Democrats getting on with this sort of defund the police so that they can sort of um, uh, uh, balance their budgets uh, 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 and continue the system. People need to demand power in the hands of the African community. And that was my co-host, Mastamela Odom. Oh, hoo, hoo, that indeed was me. And it feels a little odd to hear myself, but thanks for that, Dexter. More information on the Black is Back Coalition for Social Justice, Peace, and Reparations can be found at blackisbackcoalition.org. You can view the full conference by visiting the Black is Back Coalition's Facebook page. You have been listening to the People's War Radio Show. Today, we recap the 13th annual Black is Back Coalition's Black People's March on the White House, held from November 6 to November 7, 2021, in Washington, D.C. Our theme song, Colonial Virus, was written and performed by Elika and Goma. Thanks to the People's War Radio Show's production, research, and promotions team, including Jaja Robinson, Empress Livewire, and the Hips of Ponder. So we say down with the colonial virus. Down with the colonial virus. This has been the People's War Radio Show. Produced by WVPU Black Power Radio at 96.3 FM in St. Petersburg, Florida. WBPU is a project of the African People's Education and Defense Fund. The baddest nonprofit on the planet. Whose mission is to defend the human and civil rights of the African community. And address the grave disparities faced by African people in education, health care, and economic development. For more information on the African People's Education and Defense Fund, visit apedf.org. Episodes of the People's War Radio Show are available on the Black Power Talks podcast. For updates and resources to fight the coronavirus or to volunteer with Project Black Onk, visit developmentforafrica.org. Thank you for listening. Colonial virus, mass incarceration, that's colonial virus.